Number 395. Richard Perry Loving, et al., appellants, versus Virginia. Mr. Hirschkopf. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the Court, I am Bernard S. Cohen. I would like to move the admission of Mr. Philip J. Hirschkopf, Pro Hoc Vice, my co-counsel in this matter. He is a member of the Bar of Virginia. Your motion is granted. Mr. Hirschkopf, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Chief Justice, Associate Justice, may it please the Court. We will divide the argument accordingly. I will handle the equal protection argument as we view it, and Mr. Cohen will argue the due process argument. You have before you today what we consider the most odious of the segregation laws and the slavery laws. And our view of this law, and we hope to clearly show, is that this is a slavery law. We refer to the law itself. I would first like to bring the Court's attention. There is some discrepancy in the briefs between us and the Commonwealth, especially, as to which laws are in essence. They have particularly said that Section 2058 and 2059 of the Virginia Code are the only things for consideration by this Court. And those two sections, of course, are the criminal section, making it a criminal penalty for Negro and white to intermarry in the state of Virginia. Uh, 2058 is the evasion section under which this case particularly arose, which uh, makes it a criminal act for people to go outside the state to avoid the laws of Virginia to get married. We contend, however, Your Honors, that there is much more in essence here, that there is actually one simple issue. And the issue is, may a state proscribe a marriage between two adult consenting individuals because of their race? And this would take in much more in the Virginia statutes. Sections 2054 and 2057 void such marriages. And if they void such marriages, if you were to only decide on 2058 and 2059, these people, were they to go back to Virginia, and they are in Virginia now, will be subject to immediate arrest under the fornication statute and the lewd and lascivious cohabitation statute. And more than that, there are many, many other problems with these. Their children would be declared bastards under many Virginia decisions. They themselves would lose their rights uh, for insurance, social security, for numerous other things to which they're entitled. So we strongly urge the court in considering this to consider this basic question. May the state proscribe a marriage between such individuals because of their race and their race alone? How many states do you there are 16 states, Your Honors, that have these states presently. Maryland just repealed theirs. Uh, these all are southern states with four or five border southern states, as Oklahoma and Missouri and Delaware. Uh, there have been in recent years two, Oklahoma and Missouri, that have had bills to repeal them, but they did not pass in these states. Now, in dealing with the equal protection argument, we feel that on its face, on its face, these laws violate the equal protection of the laws. They violate the 14th Amendment. And in dealing with this, we look at the arguments advanced by the state. And there are basically two arguments advanced by the state. On the one hand, they say the 14th Amendment specifically exempted marriage from its limitations. On the other hand, they say if it didn't, that Maynard versus Hill doctrine would apply here. That this is only for the state to legislate upon. In replying to that, we think the health and welfare aspect of it is in essence. And we hope to show the court these are not health and welfare laws. These are slavery laws, pure and simple. And for this reason, we went to some length in our brief to go into the history of these laws, to look at why Virginia passed these laws and why other states have these laws on the books and how they use these laws. 
without reiterating what is in the brief, I will just refer to that history very briefly. As we pointed out in the brief, the laws go back to the 1600s. The 1691 Act is the first basic act we have. There was the 1662 Act, which held that the child of a Negro woman and a white man would be free or slave according to the condition of his mother. It was a slavery law. And it was only concerned with one thing, and it's an important element in this matter. Negro, man, white woman. That's all they were really concerned with. That may be all they're still concerned with. It's the purity of the white woman, not the purity of the Negro woman. These laws rob the Negro race of their dignity. It's the worst part of these laws. And that's what they're meant to do, to hold the Negro class in a lower position, lower social position, a lower economic position. 1691 was the first basic act, and it was entitled An Act for the Suppressing of Outlying Slaves. And the language of the act is important. It's why we go back to it. Because they talk about the prevention of that abominable mixture and spurious issue. And we'll see that language time and again throughout all the judicial decisions referred to by the state. And then they went into two centuries of trying to figure out who these people were that they were prescribing. I won't touch upon all the states. I understand amicus will do that. But at one time in 1705, it was a person with one-eighth or more Negro blood. And then in 1785, it became a person with one-quarter or more. And it went on and on. It wasn't until 1930 that we finally arrived at what a Negro is in the state of Virginia. That's a person with any traceable Negro blood, uh, a matter which we think defies any scientific interpretation. And the first real judicial decision we get in Virginia was in 1878 when the Kinney versus Commonwealth case came down. And there again, we have a very interesting decision. Because in Kinney versus Commonwealth, they talk about the public policy of the state of Virginia and what that public policy was and how it would be applied. Your honors will indulge me. I have the language here, which is the language that is carried through through the history of Virginia. And they talk about spurious issue again. And that is what's constantly carried through, and carried through for an act for the suppressing of outlying slaves. And they talk about the cherished Southern civilization. But they didn't speak about the Southern civilization as a whole, but this white Southern civilization. And they want the races kept distinct and separate. The same thing this court has heard since Brown, and before Brown but has heard so many times during the Brown argument and since the Brown argument. And they talk about alliances so unnatural that God has forbidden them. And this language... Would you mind telling me what case that was? That's Kinney versus Commonwealth, Your Honor. King. Kinney, K-I-N-N-E-Y. And then in 1924, in the period of great hysteria in the United States, a historical period we're all familiar with, a period when the West was in arms over the yellow peril. And Western states were thinking about these laws, and some got them then. A period when the immigration laws were being passed in the United States because the North was worried about the great influx of Italian immigrants and Irish immigrants. A period when the Klan rode openly in the South. And that's when they talked about bastardy of the races, and mis miscegenation, and amalgamation, and race suicide became the watchword. And John Powell a man we've singled out in our brief, a noted pianist of his day, started taking up the Darwin theory and perverting it through the theory of eugenics, a theory that applied to animals, to pigs and hogs and cattle, and started applying it to human beings, and taking Darwinism that the Negro race was the stepping stone, was that lost man we've always been looking for, between the white man and the abominable snowman, wherever else they went back. And that's when the Anglo-Saxon clubs formed in the state of Virginia, and that's when the Virginia legislature passed our present body of law. They took all these old laws, these anti-bellum and post-bellum laws, and they put them together into what we presently have. How many states for the first time in, in, that, in the 20s uh, passed these kind of laws, do you recall? Your Honor, to the best of our knowledge, basically most states had them. It was just Virginia and then Georgia copied the Virginia Act, which had such a complete act, and it was described in many places as the most perfect model of this type of act. But you were saying that the western states and the eastern states and others during the 1924 period uh, passed these laws, as I understood. Most, 
No, Your Honor. Most of them actually had them on the book. I see. All right. They uh, were summary codifications. Now, this one, Virginia strove to do this to make a perfect model law, and only Georgia followed. And it was expected from our reading of history that many other states would follow, but they just let remain what they had. There was very few repeals in those days. Actually, the great body of repeal has been since Brown, when 13 states have repealed since that time. Yeah. Well, what relevance does that 1924 period have to this? Because some of the statutes we have were enacted then. All the registration statutes were enacted in the 1924 period. And these are the statutes, basically, which you have to have a, a certificate of racial composition in the state of Virginia. The statutes, which we find absolutely most odious, the statutes reflect back to Nazi Germany and to the present South African situation. I see. But the present bill, as it sits on the books, is that law from 1924. And it was entitled, A Bill to Preserve the Integrity of the White Race, when it was initially issued. It was passed as a bill for racial integrity, to preserve racial integrity. And we would advance the argument very strongly to the court. They're not concerned with racial integrity of the Negro race, only with the white race. In fact, in Virginia, it's only a crime for white and Negro to intermarry, and the law is couched in such terms that they say white may only marry white in section 2054 of our law. Uh, but it goes on from there to make it a crime only for whites and Negroes to intermarry. There's no crime for a Malaysian to marry a Negro, and it's a, it's a valid marriage in Virginia. But it would be a void marriage for a Malaysian or any other race aside from Negro to marry a white person. A void marriage, but there'd be no criminal penalty against anyone but the white person. They were not concerned with racial integrity, but racial supremacy of the white race. 1930, they finally, as I said before, went on to say any person with traceable Negro blood was a Negro. Now, these laws, Your Honors, are ludicrous in their inception and equally ludicrous in their application. It's not possible to look at just the Virginia laws alone. You have to look at what happened in the whole South, we feel, and the classifications in the South. It's impossible to say. I won't go into, again, the exact classification of Negroes, but South Carolina, North Carolina make certain Indians white people. North Carolina, Cherokee in the Robeson County is a white person. All other Cherokee and Indians are Negroes. In South Carolina is the Catawba Indians. And these laws gave vent to other very hateful laws. In Mississippi, an uh, advocate of social equality under the mis miscegenation body of law. It's a criminal penalty. I think it carries one to five years. Now, if Your Honor, please, there are several decisions handed down by states which, again, point up the racial feeling concerning these laws. The Missouri law is bottomed on State versus Jackson which basically held that if the progeny of a mixed marriage married the progeny of a mixed marriage, there'd be no further progeny. A fundamentally ridiculous statement. May, maybe it wasn't for those men in that day and age, but it certainly is now. And Georgia has an equally ridiculous basis for the laws in Scott versus Georgia, where they held that from their daily observances, they see that the offspring of such marriages are effeminate. And in this case, and I will refer to the appellant's brief here at page 35. The Loving case comes to you based on the case of name versus name. And what were they talking about name versus name? Again, they wanted to preserve the racial integrity of their citizens. They wanted not to have a mongrel breed of citizens. We find there no requirement that the state shall not legislate to prevent the obliteration of racial pride, but must permit the corruption of blood even though it weaken or destroy the quality of the citizenship. These are racial, and equal protection thoroughly prescribes these. In the case before you, the opinion of the lower court, Judge Bazile, and we have it footnoted at page 37 of our brief, where he says, Almighty God created the right races, white, black, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. And I needn't read the whole quote, but it's a fundamentally ludicrous quote. And again, that's what they're talking about. We feel the very basic wrong of these statutes is they rob the Negro race of their dignity 
and fundamental in the concept of liberty in the 14th Amendment is the dignity of the individual. Because without that, there is no ordered liberty. We've quoted from numerous authorities, and particularly, not to go to scientific points, but particularly I refer you to the quotes from Gunnar Myrdal, who's made a noted study in recent years of this, and not the old studies that are otherwise quoted. Your Honor, please, there is one other issue that the state raises that I will touch on briefly, and that's the 14th Amendment issue. To begin with, the state advances no history of the 14th Amendment debates themselves. They go to the debates of the 1866 Act and the Freedmen's Bureau Bills, which did immediately precede the 14th Amendment. And in their own brief, they have an excellent cite that the 14th Amendment was in part designed to provide a firm constitutional basis for the Civil Rights Act. We would advance that the in part is the answer. The 14th Amendment even if you read in the history of the 1866 Act, is much broader in scope. Its language is much broader in scope. The language of liberty, due process, is much broader than the rights, privileges, and immunities that were put into the 1866 Legislative Act. It was more than an effort to put these laws beyond the grasp of a further Congress. It was a greater protection. And, Your Honor, please, even if you want to take the history of the Civil Rights Bill of 1866 we feel even reading that language that it wasn't clear and it's up to the court to decide what happened many legislators felt it would prescribe that the Civil Rights Act itself would prescribe these type of laws in the states even various proponents that amalgamation laws were not touched. And basically what they rely on in their brief <clears throat> and in their argument in the court below, and I might point out to your honors that this was argued fully in the court below and the Virginia Supreme Court didn't deign to rule on the argument but pushed it aside and went to the merits of whether these laws were or were not unconstitutional, taking into account the 14th Amendment. <clears throat> As I recall, this was put before this court in the McLaughlin case. Well, I know it was. And it was put before the lower court in the McLaughlin case. The same argument. Now, while McLaughlin was cohabitation, I think you'd have to read those laws together if they were intended to be reached because they spoke of amalgamation laws in the arguments in the 1866 Act. But even if you would read the language of Senator Trumbull, which they rely on so strongly, what did he really say? Well, at one point, page 17 of their brief, he says, I presume there is no discrimination in this respect. And he goes on to talk about his argument, the law, as I understand it in all states, applies equally. This was the pace reasoning which this court has set aside. But the real tip-off we feel on this comes on page 22, where they're quoting Trumbull again. And he says, this bill would not repeal the law to which the senator refers, replying to Senator Johnson, if there is no discrimination made by it. If there is no discrimination made by it. We submit very strongly, as has been before the court many times, that the application of the 14th Amendment is an open-ended application, even on these laws, even where we had this argument. Because he says, if it's not discriminatory, your honors must reach the conclusion whether it's discriminatory or not. And it is clearly discriminatory. We speak of this on page 30 and 31 of our brief. Quoting Bickle, a noted constitutional authority, he says they were open-ended and meant to be expounded in light of changing times and circumstances. And quoting this court from Burton v. Wilmington Parking Authority, its constitutional assurance was reserved in terms whose imprecision was necessary if the right were to be enjoyed in the variety of individual state relations. There are any number of such quotes in your opinions in the last 10 years. This is the same argument you've had before you all the time. The 14th Amendment doesn't apply. Your Honor has very adequately answered that argument in the McLaughlin decision when you said this was the central purpose of the 14th Amendment. And we submit very strongly it is the central purpose of the 14th Amendment. If Your Honor's please, in resting on the 
equal protection argument, we fail to see how any reasonable man can but conclude that these laws are slavery laws, were incepted to keep the slaves in their place, were prolonged to keep the slaves in their place, and in truth, the Virginia laws still view the Negro race as a slave race, that these are the most odious laws to come before the court. They rob the Negro race of its dignity and only a decision which will reach the full body of these laws in this state of Virginia will change that. We ask that the court consider the full spectrum of these laws and not just the criminality because it's more than a criminality that's at point here. But the legitimacy of children, the right to inherit land, the many, many rights. And in reaching a decision, we ask you to reach it on that basis. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Mr. Cohen. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court. If we were here merely to obtain a reversal on behalf of Richard Perry Loving and Mildred Gita Loving, I think Mr. Hirschkopf would have presented a cogent and complete argument based upon the Equal Protection Clause, which would leave no course but to find the statutes of question unconstitutional. However, while there is no doubt in our minds that these statutes are unconstitutional and have run afoul of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, we urge with equal strength that the statutes also run afoul of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Now, whether one articulates in terms of the right to be free from racial discrimination as being due process under the 14th Amendment, or whether one talks of the right to be free from infringement of basic values, implicit and ordered liberty, as Justice Harlan has said in the Griswold case, citing Palco versus Connecticut, or if we talk about the right to be free from arbitrary and capricious denials of 14th Amendment liberty, as Mr. Justice White has said in the concurring opinion in Griswold, or if we urge upon this court to say, as it has said before, in Meyer versus Nebraska and Skinner versus Oklahoma, that marriage is a fundamental right or liberty, and whether we go further and urge that the court say that this is a fundamental right or liberty retained by the people within the meaning of the Ninth Amendment and within the meaning of liberty in the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. Well, surely that's... Uh... There's some limit on that. I suppose you would agree that a, that a state could forbid mar a marriage between a brother and a sister, wouldn't you? We uh, uh, have conceded that the state may properly regulate marriages and may regulate divorces, and indeed they have done so, and this court has uh, upheld certain regulations. I don't know whether the issue of consanguinity or affinity has ever been here, but certainly the one that comes to mind first would be the Reynolds case in the polygamy matter, and we have no trouble distinguishing uh, those, and I, I don't think the court will either. There was no race question involved. No, but you're, you're not uh, now arguing about any race question. You're to arguing complete freedom to contract, aren't you, under the Due Process Clause? Well, uh, I, I have stated that the Due Process Clause has been subject to many articulations, and... What I was going to go on to say was that all of these articulations can find some application in this particular case. If you ask me for the strength of the argument of the 14th Amendment due process clause as applied to this case, I urge most strongly that it be on the basis that the 14th Amendment is an amendment to protect against racial discrimination. Uh, however, I do not think that the other arguments are completely invalid. I, I don't even know if the court ever has to reach them. But... Uh, one can still argue that there is liberty and a right to marry, as this court has said in Meyer and Skinner, and that in no way detracts from our argument that they cannot, the state cannot, infringe upon the right of M Richard and Mildred Loving to marry because of race. Uh, these, are, uh, uh, these are just not acceptable grounds. We're talking about 
uh, an arbitrary and capricious ground. And uh, uh, we, we uh, should have no well, trouble. Some, some people might think with reason that it's arbitrary and capricious to forbid first cousins to marry each other. The uh, state where I used to live uh, does have such a law prohibiting first cousins from marrying each other. Now, be, because... Uh, a large body of opinion might think that's arbitrary and capricious. Does that mean that the state has no constitutional power to pass such a statute? I believe that we run into another uh, step before we can reach that, uh, Your Honor, and that is the burden of coming forth with the evidence. I think that a state can legislate and can restrict marriage and might even be able to go so far as to restrict marriage between first cousins as some states have. And I think that if that case were before the court, they would not have the advantage that we have of a presumption being shifted and a burden being shifted to the state to show that they have a reasonable basis for proscribing interracial marriages. However, if we were here on a first cousin's case, I think we would have the tougher road to hoe because we would have to come in and show that the proscription was arbitrary and capricious, was not based upon some reasonable grounds. And that is a difficult thing for an appellant to do. Thankfully, we are not here with that burden. The state is. And we submit that the state cannot overcome that burden. Not only do we submit that they cannot, but for the purposes of this case, we certainly submit they have not. Nowhere in the state's brief, nowhere in the legislative history of the 14th Amendment, nowhere in the legislative history of Virginia's anti-miscegenation statutes, is there anything clearer than what Mr. Hirschkopf has already elucidated that these are racial statutes to perpetuate the badges and bonds of slavery. That is not a permissible state action. <clears throat> Your Honor, there have not been any efforts, and I can tell you from a personal experience that Candidates who run for office for the state legislature have told me that they would under no circumstances sacrifice their political lives by attempting to introduce such a bill. There is one candidate who has indicated that he would probably do so at some time in the future, but most of them have indicated that it would be uh, political suicide in Virginia. May I ask you if you are arguing the due process question on the theory that even if the court holds it violates the equal protection laws, it's necessary to go on and reach the broad expanses you mentioned? Your Honor, we should be very pleased to have a decision from this court that all of these statutes are unconstitutional based upon the equal protection clause. However, what we are concerned about is that the court, if it uses the equal protection argument, to find the statute unconstitutional, that there might be some way that uh, Virginia could possibly get around this by reenacting a statute that was that would absolutely only permit whites to marry whites, Negroes to marry Negroes, Malaysians to marry Malaysians, and uh, uh, possibly might we might be back here again. I don't see how that would be possible. That Court Hill, according to the first argument, this is a plain violation. Of the equal protection of Well, I, I quite agree, Your Honor, and I, I do think that the equal protection uh, uh, argument is, is the uh, strongest argument, it is the correct argument, and it is the uh, basis upon which we strongly urge the court to rule. We are mostly concerned about a narrow ruling that would not go to the whole section of statutes. There are ten sections, sections 20-50 through 20-60, and this is our chief concern, that uh, the court might not touch the racial composition certificate statute. And the racial composition certificate, section 20-50, says that anybody in Virginia who applies to the state registrar of vital statistics shall be given a certificate of racial composition. He goes and he says, he goes up to the clerk of the court and says, I'm white, I want a certificate of racial composition, then I'm white, or I'm Negro, I want a certificate of racial composition, then I'm Negro. And if the clerk looks at him and believes him, he has him fill out something and certifies it to the way it looks to him, this person is white or is Negro, and he sends down to Richmond and gets his certificate of racial composition. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this has not been used in recent years, and I don't know what its extent was 
uh, back around 1924, except that the legislative history shows that they brought in the state registrar of vital statistics, and uh, uh, he testified that there was great confusion uh, under the old law as to who was a member of which race, and that they were having a little bit of difficulty determining uh, who was a member of which race and who could be prescribed for marrying whom, and uh, called for this very strict statute, which now says that white persons may only marry white persons. Therefore, what they've done is make it a crime for a white person to marry a Negro or a Negro person to marry a white person. But it's not a crime for a Negro to marry a Malaysian. It's a void marriage in Virginia, and they may be prosecuted for violation of the fornication statutes, but not for a violation of the, of the anti-miscegenation statute. The uh, Section 20-54 merely makes civil disability apparent in a, white, in a marriage between a, uh, a uh, uh, white and a Malaysian, or a Negro and a, uh, uh, a uh, well, um, we're not exactly sure about that, but between a white and anybody else but a, uh, another white or a Negro, it is not a criminal act. And therefore, they are under great civil disability. They, uh, the children are illegitimate. Uh, uh, the wife could cannot... That, could that possibly be fit true? The court should decide straight out that the state cannot prevent the marriage the relationship of marriage between the whites and the blacks because of their color. Absolutely not. That would be no problem to that us, would Your Honor. It, it? Yes, I think it would. That would settle it constitutionally. I believe it would. The enormity of the injustices involved under this statute is mere, merely serves as indicia of how the civil liabilities amount to a denial of due process to the individuals involved. As I started to say before, no matter how we articulate this, no matter which theory of the due process clause or which emphasis we attach to, no one can articulate it better than Richard Loving when he said to me, Mr. Cohen, tell the court I love my wife and it is just unfair that I can't live with her in Virginia. I think this uh, very simple layman has a concept of fundamental fairness and ordered liberty that he can articulate as a bricklayer that we hope this court has set out time and time again in its decisions on the due process clause. With respect to the legislative history urged by the state as being conclusive that the 14th Amendment did not mean to make unconstitutional state statutes prohibiting miscegenation, we want to emphasize three important points. One, only a small group of senators in any of the debates cited ever express themselves at all with respect to the miscegenation statutes. There are perhaps five or six that are even quoted, and these were for the Freedmen's Bureau Bill and the Act, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1866. If absence of debate ever has any influence at all, this is a classic case. Nowhere has the state been able to cite one item of legislative debate on the 14th Amendment itself with respect to anti-miscegenation statutes, not one item. All of their references are to the 1866 Act. And again, we point out that those comments are, were very carefully worded by both the proponents and opponents of the bill. Again, we carefully point out that their own record of the legislative history shows that there were just as many senators who believed that indeed, especially the southern senators whose states had anti-miscegenation statutes, there were just as many of them who did believe that the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 would invalidate such an act. Their own passages that they printed in the brief around pages 30 through 33 uh, uh, are replete with support for our argument that, that uh, the, at best, at best, the legislative history is inconclusive. And as this court has found before, 
and we hope will continue to find. The 14th Amendment is an amendment which grows and can be applied to situations as our knowledge becomes greater and as our progress is made, and that there will be no problem in finding that this set of statutes in Virginia are odious to the 14th Amendment. I have been uh, questioned about the right of the state to regulate marriage, and I think that where the court has found that the state could, in fact, regulate marriage with impermissible grounds, they have gone on, as they did in the Reynolds case, to find that the people, that there was a danger to the principles on which the government of the people, to a greater or lesser extent, rests. I ask this court if the state is urging here that there is some state principle involved or some principle of the people involved that is a proper principle of theirs, what is it? What is the danger to the state of Virginia of interracial marriage? What is the state of the danger to the people of interracial marriage? This question has been carefully avoided. Is, uh, what is the order? Have you agreed upon an order, or, or I would think Mr. Moritani would probably be next. Uh, that would be my understanding, Mr. Chief Justice. Yes, well, that would be the normal way. Mr. Moritani, you may proceed. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the Court. My name is William Moritani, legal counsel for the Japanese American Citizens League, which has filed a brief amici curiae in this appeal. On behalf of the Japanese American Citizens League, I'd like to thank this Court for this privilege. Because the uh, issues before this court today revolve around the question of race, may I be excused in making a brief personal reference in this regard. As an Issei, that is an American born and raised in this country, but whose parents came from Japan, I am, and I say this with some trepidation of being challenged, perhaps among those few in this courtroom, along with a few other Nisei who happen to be here this morning, who can declare with some degree of certainty the verity of his race. That is, if the term race is, defi is defined as an endogamous or inbreeding geographic population group this being the broad definition of convenience utilized by anthropologists. Now, those who would trace their ancestry to the European cultures where, over the centuries, there have been invasions, cross-invasions, population shifts, with the inevitable crossbreeding which follows, and particularly those same Europeans who have been part of the melting pot of America, I suggest would have a most difficult, if not impossible, task of establishing what Virginia's anti-miscegenation statutes require, namely, and I quote, proving, proving that, quote, no trace whatever of any blood other than calcation. This is what Virginia's statutes would require. Incidentally, this presupposes that the term Caucasian is susceptible of some meaningful definition, a burden, incidentally, which Virginia's laws somehow conveniently overlooks. But then this same infirmity applies to the remaining 15 states 
which have similar anti-miscegenation laws. Now, while the most sophisticated anthropologists, with all their specialized training and expertise, flatly reject the notion of any pure race, and in this connection, I refer to the UNESCO proposal of Statement on Race, which is attached as Appendix A to the amicus brief, and incidentally, also signed by Professor Carlton Kuhn, who is uh, very frequently cited by those who would uphold uh, uh, racial differences. Now, notwithstanding the fact that anthropologists reject, flatly reject, the concept of any notion of a pure race under Section 2053 of Virginia's laws, the clerk or the deputy clerk is endowed with the power to determine whether an applicant for a marriage license is, quote, of pure white race, the clerk or his deputy. Moreover, the Commonwealth of Virginia would have laymen, that is, clerks, judges, and juries, take vague and standardless terms such as colored person, white person, Caucasian, and apply them to specific situations, coupled with the power in these laymen to invoke civil and criminal sanctions, where in their view and interpretation of these terms, the laws of Virginia have been violated. I believe no citation is required to state or to conclude that this is vagueness in its grossest sense. I refer the court again to the decision of this court in Giacchio versus Pennsylvania, decided in 1966, in which the court stated that such a law, quote, which leaves judges and jurors free to decide without any legally fixed standards what is prohibited and what is not in each particular case fails to meet the requirements of the due process clause. Now let us assume arguendo that race, there are such things as definable races within the human species, that these can be defined with sufficient clarity and certainty as to be accurately applied in particular situations, and further let's assume that the state of Virginia's laws do exactly this. And incidentally, all of this is something that the anthropologists have not been able to do. We submit that nevertheless, the anti-miscegenation laws of Virginia and its sister states are unconstitutional. For if the anti-miscegenation laws purport to preserve morphologic or physical differences, that is, the differences essentially in the shape of the eyes, the size of noses or the texture of hair, pigmentation of skin, such differences are meaningless and neutral. They serve no proper legislative purpose. To state the proposition in itself is to expose the utter absurdity. Moreover, the anti-miscegenation laws would take the aspiration of marriage, which is common to all people, and which is otherwise blessed by the state, and which institution, incidentally, is founded, of course, upon one of man's biological drives, it would take this and solely on the basis of race, it would convert it into a crime. In McLaughlin, where this court uh, considered a Florida statute which involved, quote, concepts of sexual decency, dealing with extramarital and premarital promiscuity, this court nevertheless struck down such statute because it was formulated on racial classification and thus laid an unequal hand on those who committed intrinsically the same quality of offense. Now, for the appellants here, Richard Loving and Mildred Loving, <coughs> marriage in and of itself is not a crime. It is not an offense, even under Virginia's laws. By Virginia's laws, it was their race, it was their race which made it an offense. Incidentally, while Mr. Loving apparently admitted that he was white, and thereby admitted to the fact which rendered his marriage a criminal act under Virginia's laws. It is suggested that he was incapable of making a knowing admission 
that he was, quote, of pure white race, or, quote, had no trace whatever of any blood other than Caucasian. Now, we further submit that the anti-miscegenation laws involve an unequal application of the laws. Virginia's expressed state policy for its anti-miscegenation laws has been declared to maintain, quote, purity of public morals, preservation of racial integrity, as well as racial pride, and to prevent a mongrel breed of citizens. However, under these anti-miscegenation laws, since only white persons are prevented from marrying outside of their race, and all other races are free to intermarry, and within this particular context are free thereby to despoil one another and destroy their racial integrity, purity, and pride. Virginia's laws are exposed for exactly what they are, a concept based upon racial superiority, that of the white race and white race only. Now, we submit that striking down of the anti-miscegenation laws will, first of all, not do certain things. It will not force anyone to do what he presently does not wish to do. It does not force anyone to marry outside of his race by striking down the anti-miscegenation laws. By striking down the anti-miscegenation laws, no one is caused to do, undo anything but she has already done. And in this connection, perhaps a distinction may be made to the Brown case or the school desegregation cases. <clears throat> On the contrary, by striking down the anti-miscegenation laws, freedom of choice will be restored to all individuals, including those who are opposed to racial intermarriage. For the white person who marries another white person does not, under Virginia's laws as they now stand, have any other choice. We submit that race as a factor has no proper place in state's laws governing whom a person, by mutual choice, may or may not marry. Now the nature of such statutory intervention upon personal freedom may be exposed by applying the same operative racial principle in reverse. Let us suppose that the state of Virginia exercised its powers of determining, of applying this racial principle, so that it decrees that every citizen must marry a person of a different race. This would indeed be shocking, that the same operative principle is, happens to be geared in the way it is presently geared, makes it no less shocking and demeaning to the citizen. A question so was you, raised... You concede, Mr. Maritani, that uh, if the law provided that uh, uh, the other races, so-called, uh, uh, must not intermarry, that the law would be good? No, sir. Mr. Chief Justice, we submit that, first of all, it is no answer to compound what we believe to be wrong. Moreover, as a practical matter, who is to determine, who is to categorize how many races there are? The anthropologists range from two to 200. They themselves, and they are the so-called experts, they are unable to agree. If anthropologists do, cannot agree, I, I would assume that it would ex be extremely difficult for legislators to determine, and then having determined it, to apply it. Yes. The, the reason I asked it was because there was some intimation what you said that, uh, that they were denied uh, equal protection and that there was not the same prohibition against uh, intermarrying of the other so-called races. Uh, the, uh, I believe the thrust of that argument, sir, is that to expose this law for exactly what it is, it is a white supremacy law. May I ask you not material, perhaps, in any way, but do you happen to know whether there are any laws in Japan which prohibit the other marriage between Japanese and 
what you might call Caucasians or white people? Well, uh, Mr. Justice Black, I might answer that. I do not know, except by custom. I can state, for example, that my own mother would have strenuously objected to my marrying a person of the white race. Now, Mr. Justice Potter, I believe, raised the question as to whether or not the state properly has a function to play in the area of control of marriage. Reference was made to consanguinity, and of course there are other standards, mentality, age. Age, and, uh, and I suppose number of spouses. Yes. Now, we submit that the racial classification cannot be equated with these standards because Racial classification is not an additional standard which is added on the same level as these standards which were just enumerated. They are superimposed over and above all these other standards. To restate it in another way, the standards of consanguinity, mentality, age, and number of spouses and so forth apply to all races. White, black, yellow, doesn't matter. To all races, without any distinction. But now the racial factor is superimposed over and above this and is therefore is not on the same level. It is something different. It is something additional and over and above and on a different level. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. McElwain. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court. As an assistant attorney general of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I appear as one of counsel for the appellee in support of the judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeals of our state affirming the constitutional validity of the two statutes which are involved in this case. In view of what has been said before, it may not be inappropriate at this point to emphasize that there are only two statutes before this court for consideration, section 20-58 and 20-59 of the Virginia Code. These statutes, in their combined effect, prohibit white people from marrying colored people and colored people from marrying white people under the same penal sanction and forbid citizens of Virginia of either race from leaving the state with the intent and purpose of evading this law. No other statutes are involved in this case. No attempt has been made by any Virginia official to apply any other statute to the marital relationship before this court, the decision of the Supreme Court of Appeals of Virginia can be read from beginning to end without finding any other statute mentioned in it except 20-58 and 20-59, with the exception of that one provision which relates to the power of a court to suspend the execution of sentence upon which ground the Supreme Court of Appeals of Virginia referred this case back to the lower court to have a new condition of suspension imposed. With that exception, only two provisions of the Virginia Code are mentioned. Therefore, we take the position that these are the only statutes before the court, and anything that may have to do with any other provision of the Virginia Code which imposes a prohibition on the white race only, or has to do with certificates of racial composition, whatever they may be, are not properly before this court. This is a statute which applies to a Virginia situation and forbids the intermarriage of the white and colored races. I we pause on the question of equal protection. Maybe your, your section, which allows anyone with one sixteenth or less of Indian blood to, uh, to intermarry with, uh, with whites, would have some significance, would it not? For, for the, this one says anyone who has a drop of of uh, colored blood uh, in them uh, cannot marry with a white. That would only be significant, Mr. Chief Justice, with respect to that provision 2054, which is not before the court, which says that a white person shall not marry any other save a white person or a person having no other admixture of blood than white and American Indian. That is a special statute, that is the 2054 statute, against which I myself could find a number of of constitutional objections, perhaps, in that it imposes a restriction upon one race alone, which it does not oppose on the other races, and therefore more stringently curtails the rights of one racial group. But so, but you do uh, put a restriction on 
North American Indians, if they have more than one sixteenth of Indian blood in them, do you not? Yes, sir. But this is because in Virginia we have only two races of people which are within the territorial boundaries of the state of Virginia in sufficient numbers to constitute a classification with which the legislature must deal. That is why I say the white and the colored prohibition here completely controls the racial uh, picture with which Virginia is faced. You have no Indians in Virginia? Well, we have Indians, Your Honor, but this is the point that we make with respect to them. Under the census figures of 1960, 79 and some odds hundreds percent of the Virginia population was made up of white people. Twenty and some odd hundreds percent of the Virginia population was made up of colored people. Whites and Negroes, by definition of the United States Department of Commerce Bureau of the Census. Thus, 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of the Virginia population falls into these two racial categories. All other racial classes in Virginia combined do not constitute as much as one-fourth of one percent of the Virginia population. Therefore, we say that this problem of the intermarriage of whites and Orientals, or Negroes and Orientals, or any of these two classes with Polynesians or Indians or Asiatic Indians is not a problem with which Virginia is faced, and one which it is not required to adapt its policy forbidding interracial marriage to. A statute, of course, does not have to apply with mathematical precision, but on the basis of the Virginia population, we respectfully submit that the statute before the court in this case does apply almost with mathematical precision, since it covers all the dangers which Virginia has a right to apprehend from interracial marriage in that it prohibits the intermarriage of those two groups which constitute more than 99% of the Virginia population. Now, so far as the particular appellants in this case are concerned, there is no question of constitutional vagueness or doubtful definition. It is a matter of record agreed to by all counsel during the course of this litigation and in the brief that one of the appellants here is a white person within the definition of the Virginia law, the other appellant is a colored person within the definition of the Virginia law. Thus, the court is simply faced with a proposition of whether or not a state may validly forbid the interracial marriage of two groups, the white and the colored, in the context of the present statute. Does Virginia have a statute on its books with the interracial marriage couple? Yes, sir. Do you know of any Virginia? No, sir, it does not. We have the question of whether or not that marriage would be recognized as valid in Virginia, even though it was contracted by parties who were not residents of the state of Virginia under the conflict of laws principle that a marriage valid where celebrated is valid everywhere. This would be a serious question, and under Virginia law, it is highly questionable that such a marriage would be recognized in Virginia, especially since Virginia has a very strong policy against interracial marriage and the implementing statutes declare that marriages between white and colored people shall be absolutely void without decree of divorce or other legal process, the implementing statute which forbids Virginia citizens to leave the state for the purpose of evading the law and returning, the exception to the conflict of laws principle I've stated that, the ma that a marriage valid where celebrated would be valid everywhere, except where contrary to the, long, to the strong local public policy. The Virginia statute here involved does express a strong local public policy against the intermarriage of white and colored people. Now, with respect to any other interracial marriage, this the policy of the Virginia statute here involved does not express any sentiment at all. And we do not have any decision of the Virginia Supreme Court, Mr. Justice Harlan, which would shed light on that proposition so far as other races are concerned. Well, it, it has been suggested that it would. I do not know whether Virginia is, or any state, yes, sir, is required to recognize a marriage which is contrary to its own laws, especially 
with respect to matters within its own state. Now, the appellants, of course, have asserted that the Virginia statute here under attack is violative of the 14th Amendment. We assert that it is not, and we do so on the basis of two contentions and two contentions only. The first contention is that the 14th Amendment, viewed in the light of its legislative history, has no effect whatever upon the power of states to enact anti-miscegenation laws, specifically anti-miscegenation laws forbidding the intermarriage of white and colored persons, and therefore, as a matter of law, this court, under the 14th Amendment, is not authorized to infringe the power of the state that the 14th Amendment does not, read in the light of its history, touch, much less diminish the power of the states in this regard. The second contention, an alternative contention, is that if the 14th Amendment be deemed to apply to state anti-miscegenation statutes, then this statute serves a legitimate legislative objective of preventing the sociological and psychological evils which attend interracial marriages and is a, an expression, a rational expression, of a policy which Virginia has a right to adopt. So far as the legislative history of the amendment is concerned, we do not understand that this court has ever avowed in principle the proposition that it is necessary in construing the 14th Amendment to give effect to the intention of the framers. With respect to the instant situation, you are not presented with any question involving a dubious application of certain principles to a situation which was unforeseen or unknown to those who framed the principles. The precise question before this court today, the validity under the 14th Amendment of a statute forbidding the marriage of whites and Negroes was precisely before the Congress of the United States 100 years ago when it adopted the amendment. The situation is perfectly clear that those who considered the amendment against a charge of infringing state power to forbid white and colored marriages specifically excluded that power from the scope of the 14th Amendment. Do you get that from the debates on the 14th Amendment? Yes, Your Honor. We get it from the specifically where, where from the debates quote, Where do you quote that in your brief? We get it specifically, Your Honor, from the debates leading to the 14th Amendment, the debates on the Freedmen's Bureau Bill and the Civil Rights Act of 1866. That is a little different, though, isn't it? Only to this extent, Your Honor. The 14th Amendment has been construed by members of this court a number of times in its historical setting. The court has said on a number of instances that the specific debates on the Freedmen's Bureau Bill and the Civil Rights Act of 1866 which act ultimately became the first section of the 14th Amendment are the most material relating to the 14th Amendment. Now, in this situation, by the time the Freedmen's Bureau Bill and the Civil Rights Act of 1866 had been debated and passed, the issue of whether or not the 14th of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 would infringe the power of the states to pass anti-miscegenation statutes was so completely settled that when the 14th Amendment resolution was brought on, the question was no longer considered to be an open one. It is said in our brief and pointed out by our adversaries that we take the position that the 14th Amendment was designed in part to place the Civil Rights Act of 1866 in the Constitution and beyond the reach of shifting congressional majorities. We say in part only because, as Mr. Justice Black has pointed out in his dissent in the Adamson case, there were a number of reasons why people thought the first section of the 14th Amendment was included. Some people thought that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was absolutely unconstitutional and that it was necessary to pass an amendment to validate it. Others thought that the act was perfectly constitutional but that it could be repealed and that it was necessary to place it in the Constitution to keep it from being repealed. Still others thought that the first section of the 14th Amendment was nothing but the Civil Rights Bill of 1866 in another shape. Nobody suggested that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and its adoption into the first section of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution expanded 
the rights which were covered in the 1866 bill, and certainly no one suggested that what was expressly removed from the 1866 Act was reinserted in the Constitution in the 14th Amendment within a period of just a few months. Now, the debates on the Civil Rights Act of 1866 clearly show that the proponents, those who had the bill in charge, those who were instrumental in passing the first section of the 14th Amendment, clearly, in answer to questions put by their adversaries, stated in no uncertain terms that the bill had no application to the state's power to forbid marriages between white and colored persons, not simply amalgamation, but specifically between white and colored persons. This was repeatedly stated by Senator Trumbull, who was the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee who steered the bill to passage and was instrumental in passing the first section of the 14th Amendment, by Senator William Pitt Fessenden of Maine, who was the leading Republican member on the Joint Committee of Reconstruction of 15, and by various other members who supported the bill and steered it to passage. Now, text writers have disagreed as to whether or not the charge that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 would invalidate state laws was seriously made or whether it was made for political purposes simply as a smokescreen. Regardless of the purpose for which it was made, the historical fact remains that the challenge was put by those who disagreed with the Civil Rights Act of 1866, that it would affect the power of the states to pass anti-miscegenation statutes, and the proponents and the managers who had the bill in charge absolutely denied that it would have any such effect. No one who voted for, sponsored, or espoused the Civil Rights Act of 1866 dared to suggest that it would have the effect of invalidating state anti-miscegenation statutes. Thus we have a clear intent on the part of those who framed and adopted the amendment to exclude this area of state power from the reach of the amendment. And this history is buttressed by the fact that the state legislatures which ratified the amendment clearly did not understand that it would have any effect at all upon their power to pass anti-miscegenation statutes. Mr. McElwain, what do you do with this court's decision in McLaughlin against Florida? I don't believe you discussed that in your brief. At least I don't remember that you did. No, sir, we do not. We simply say that it relates to a statute which is above and beyond or extraneous to the interracial marriage statute, specifically left this question open for future decision, and the question le left open in McLaughlin is now here. I understand that, but uh, your adversaries get a great deal of comfort out of McLaughlin in theory and principle and uh, with respect to the specific points you've been making here. I do not think they take any uh, comfort from McLaughlin with respect to the legislative history of the 14th Amendment, Your Honor. They take comfort, of course, from the dicta of Mr. Justice Stewart that uh, it is impossible for a state under the 14th Amendment to make the criminal act turn upon the color of the skin of the individual. And uh, if that dicta, of course, stands unchallenged, they have reason to take comfort from it in this case. But it has nothing, it has nothing to do with the, 14th, the legislative history of the 14th Amendment, nor do I understand it in McLaughlin, that the court considered this point. Yes, sir, but we, we do not put forward the, the proposition that the Pace case does justify this statute. I mean, so if they want to take comfort in that, that's, uh, they may be our guess. We simply say that uh, the, the power of the state to forbid interracial marriages, if we get beyond the 14th Amendment, can be justified on other grounds. That is our basic position. Yes, Your Honor. But uh, McLaughlin could not have been decided. Perhaps McLaughlin could 
could not have been decided as it was if the court had, had accepted that premise. The legislative history? Well, I don't know that the legislative history would support the proposition with respect to uh, statutes with, uh, on lewd and lascivious cohabitation and so forth. My legislative history, or the legislative history which we have set out, specifically relates to interracial marriage. The legislative history was raised Well, so far as this case is concerned, we would like to point out one fact which, or one circumstance which we think is analogous. Perhaps the most far-reaching decision of this court, so far as the popular mind is concerned, in the last quarter of a century has been Brown against the Board of Education. In that case, the matter was argued in 1952, and in 1953, this court restored the case to the docket for re-argument and entered an order in which it had called the attention of all counsel in that case to certain matters which the court in bank wished to have counsel consider. The first of these questions was, and I am quoting now from the court's order, what evidence is there that the Congress which submitted and the state legislatures and conventions which ratified the 14th Amendment contemplated or did not contemplate, understood or did not understand, that it would abolish segregation in public schools. Now, of course it cannot be, no presumption can be indulged that that question was put to the eminent counsel in that case simply as an academic exercise. The matter was material to this court to determine what the evidence was with respect to the intention of those who adopted the 14th Amendment and the legislatures which ratified it. It was material to the proper disposition of that case. And in response to that question, on behalf of South Carolina, Mr. John W. Davis filed a brief in excess of 150 pages. And on behalf of the Commonwealth of Virginia, the former Attorney General of Virginia and private counsel filed another brief in excess of 150 pages on that point. The current Solicitor General of the United States, on behalf of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Mr. Thurgood Marshall, also filed a brief of a similar length in which both sides of this question was presented to this court. In view of the conflict which the court found there to result, the court said that the legislative history on this point was unclear. Now that proposition cannot arise in this case because the legislative history on this point is all one way. No one has been found who has analyzed this problem who has suggested that it was the intention of the framers of the 14th Amendment or the understanding of the legislatures which ratified it that the 14th Amendment affected to any degree the power of the states to forbid the intermarriage of white and colored citizens. Or the people who spoke to the question for suggesting that the language of the statutes they were then debating did not cover uh, uh, interracial marriage. For the proponents in saying that it did not cover, the basis placed were two. One, that if the statute equally forbade the white race to marry the colored race and the colored race to marry the white race, then in the opinion of the framers that, that was not a violation of equal protection or due process. In other words, the classification itself was not a violation. The second was that historically the regulation of the marital relationship was within the states and that there was no intent on the 14th Amendment to have any effect at all upon the state's power over marriage. These are the two bases. So whether you, you're arguing that whether or not that first reason uh, uh, hasn't stood up in terms of 14th Amendment adjudication. It has no effect uh, on the intention of that, the framers uh, the fact that it has not Even stood. if they were wrong, even if they intended to exclude it for the wrong reason, they nevertheless intended to exclude it. That's correct, Your Honor. How can a subsequent difference in approach of this court after the framers of the 14th Amendment are dead and buried possibly have any effect upon what they intended when they wrote this language? Now, under this the language which they used in saying that it had no relate, it had no effect upon the state's power over marriage, 
They also said, provided no discrimination is made by it, it's clear under the legislative history of the 14th Amendment that if a statute had forbade white people to marry colored people and then had a different penalty prescribed for violation of that statute, that even the framers of the 14th Amendment would have thought that that would have been unconstitutional and that the 14th Amendment was specifically designed to these meet de- that difference in penalty proposition. These debates didn't, or these statements didn't take place uh, uh, with respect to the 14th Amendment itself, did, it, did they? No, Your Honor, these, the material which we have set up... They were contemporaneous. Absolutely contemporaneous. The 14th Amendment resolution was brought on for consideration in early 1866, and it stayed in committee while the Three Freedmen's Bureau Bill and the Civil Rights Act of 1866 were steered to passage. Then after they were steered to passage, the debate began on the 14th Amendment. And by the time that began, this question of whether or not the Civil Rights Act of 1866 had any effect upon the power of the states to forbid interracial marriages was so thoroughly settled that it did not even become an issue. The question there was whether or not the act was constitutional or unconstitutional and needed the first section of the 14th Amendment to substantiate it. But there's no suggestion was ever made that it expanded the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Our reading of the legislative history is sufficient to lead us to believe that if anybody had suggested that it would have that effect, the entire first section of the 14th Amendment would have been lost. No one, the proponents would never have suggested that the 14th Amendment was going to abolish the power of the states to forbid interracial marriages. Thus we say that if the legislative history is given effect in this case, the statute of Virginia cannot be held to violate it. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court, we would sum up the argument which we have made on behalf of the legislative history of the 14th Amendment by referring to a statement of Mr. Justice Black in his dissenting opinion in the recent case of South Carolina against Katzenbach. Two sentences which read as follows. I see no reason to read into the Constitution meanings it did not have when it was adopted and which have not been put into it since. The proceedings of the original Constitutional Convention show beyond all doubt that the power to veto or negative state laws was denied Congress. We respectfully assert that there is no propriety in this Court's reading into the Constitution meanings it did not have when it was adopted or expanding the reach of the Constitution to embrace a subject which was specifically excluded by the framers. Well, Mr. McElwain, uh, wouldn't it be pretty clear in the absence, in the absence of uh, the specific legislative history to which you refer us, if there just were no history, wouldn't it be pretty clear that the very purpose of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment was to provide that every state had to treat Negro citizens the same as white citizens, so far as their laws go? Isn't that what the Equal Protection Clause means? Yes, sir, I think it does. I think that's reinforced by the legislative history, and I don't know exactly how to consider the question aside from the legislative history, but that is clearly indicated in the legislative history itself. That is, that was the very purpose of the Equal Protection Clause coming as it did after the, in the wake of the Civil War. That is correct. But it is clear that the framers understood that in their intention, a law which equally forbade the members of one race to marry the members of another race with the same penal sanction on both did treat mm-hmm. the individuals of both race equally. Turning then to our alternative argument, which we say can only be reached if the legislative history of the 14th Amendment is ignored and the 14th Amendment is deemed to reach the state power to enact laws relating to the marriage relationship, we say that the prevention of interracial marriage is a legitimate exercise of the state power, that there is a rational classification certainly so far as the Virginia population is concerned, for preventing marriages between white and colored people who make up the, uh, almost the entirety of the state's population, and that this is supported by the prevailing climate 
of scientific opinion. We take the, prop the position that while there is evidence on both sides of this question, when such a situation exists, it is for the legislature to draw its conclusions, and that these conclusions are entitled to wait, and unless it can be clearly said that there is no debatable question, that a statute of this type cannot be declared unconstitutional. We start with a proposition on this connection that it is the family which constitutes the structural element of society, and that marriage is the legal basis upon which families are formed. Consequently, this court has held in numerous decisions over the years that society is structured on the institution of marriage, that it has more to do with the welfare and civilizations of a people than any other institutions, and that out of the fruits of marriage spring relationships and responsibilities with which the state is necessarily required to deal. Text writers and judicial writers agree that the state has a natural, direct, and vital interest in maximizing the number of successful marriages which lead to stable homes and families, and in minimizing those which do not. It is clear from the most recent available evidence on the psychosociological aspect of this question that intermarried families are subjected to much greater pressures and problems than are those of the intramarried, and that the state's prohibition of interracial marriage for this reason stands on the same footing as the prohibition of polygamous marriage or incestuous marriage or the proscription of minimum ages at which people may marry and the prevention of the marriage of people who are mentally incompetent. There are people who have the same, uh, same feeling about uh, interreligious marriages, but because that may be true, would you think that uh, the state could prohibit uh, people from having interreligious inter marriages? I think that the evidence in support of the prohibition of interracial marriages is stronger than that for the pro prohibition of interreligious inter marriages, but I think say, that the... How can you say that? Well, we say that because, principally... Because you believe that? No, sir, we say it principally on the basis of the authority which we have cited in our brief, particularly this one volume, which we have cited from copiously in our brief, which Who is, wrote that? This is a book by Dr. Albert I. Gordon, Your Honor, which is characterized as the definitive book on intermarriage and as the most careful, up-to-date, methodologically sound study of intermarriage in North America that exists. It is entitled Intermarriage, Interfaith, Interracial, Interethnic. Now, our proposition on the psychosociological aspects of this question is bottomed almost exclusively on this particular volume. This is the work of a Jewish rabbi who is also has a MA in sociology and a PhD in social anthropology. It is a statistical study of over 5,000 marriages which was aided by the computers of the Harvard Laboratory of Social Relations and the MIT Computation Center. This book has been given statistical form and basis to the proposition that from the psychosociological point of view, interracial marriages are detrimental to the individual, to the family, and to society. I do not say that the author of this book would advocate the prohibition of such marriages by law, but we do say that he personally <coughs> clearly expresses his view as a social scientist that interracial marriages are definitely undesirable, that they hold no promise for a bright and happy future for mankind, and that the interracial <clears throat> marriages bequeath to the progeny of those marriages more psychological problems than parents have a right to bequeath to them. As I say, this book has been widely accepted, and it was published <clears throat> in 1964 as being the definitive book on intermarriage in North America that exists. Is he an orthodox or unorthodox rabbi? I have not been able to ascertain that, Your Honor, from uh, any of the material that I've gotten. He is the rabbi of the Temple Emanuel in Newton Center, Massachusetts. I do not understand that uh, the, certainly the religious view of the orthodox or the conservative or the uh, reformed Jewish faith disagree necessarily on this particular proposition, but I cannot say 
whether Dr. Gordon is an Orthodox or a Reformed <clears throat> Jewish rabbi. I am more interested, of course, in his credentials as a scientist <clears throat> for this purpose, as a uh, doctor of social anthropology and as a sociologist than, of course, I am in his religious affiliation. But it is clear, unmistakably clear, and we have set it forth, as I say, in our brief and in the appendix to our brief, the results of the study which has been made and which is embodied in this volume. <clears throat> as I say, it was published in 1964, and some of the statements which are made in it based upon <laughs> the demonstrably, statistically demonstrably greater ratio of, of, marry, of divorce, annulment, in intermarried couples than in intramarried couples. Dr. Gordon has stated it as his opinion that it is my conviction that intermarriage is definitely inadvisable, that they are wrong because they are most frequently, if not solely, entered into under the present day circumstances by people who have a rebellious attitude towards society, self-hatred, neurotic tendencies, immaturity, and other detrimental psychological factors. Of course, you don't know what is his cause and what his effect. Assuming the validity of these statistics, I suppose one could be argued that one reason that uh, marriages of this kind are sometimes unsuccessful is the existence of the kind of laws that are an issue here and the, and the attitudes that those laws reflect. I think it is more the latter, the attitudes that perhaps the laws reflect. I don't find anywhere in this that the existence of the law does it. It is the attitude which society has toward interracial marriages, which, in detailing his opposition, says causes a child to have almost insuperable difficulties in identification, and that the problems which a, the child of an interracial marriage faces are those which no child can come through without damage to himself. Now, if the state has an interest in marriage, if it has an interest in maximizing the uh, number of stable marriages and in protecting the progeny of interracial marriages from these problems, then clearly there is scientific evidence available that this is so. It is not infrequent that the children of intermarried parents are referred to not merely as the children of intermarried parents, but as the victims of intermarried parents and as the martyrs of intermarried parents. These are direct quotes from the volume. Does Mr. Gordon <coughs> take the position that there is a uh, uh, basic uh, difference in intelligence uh, uh, in the races? No, sir, I don't understand that he does or that he purports to say one way or the other about the biological differences. This is not his field. In other words, genetics and biology. He reviews the materials on this and concludes for the purposes of his study that biologically and genetically there is probably no justification for the prevention of intermarriage. Then he takes it further into the psychosociological field and its effect upon children and upon the intermarried couples. And this is what <coughs> his views are based upon. I was wondering what you thought of the, the findings of this uh, great committee of UNESCO where, where about <clears throat> 20 of the greatest anthropologists in the world joined unanimously in making some very cogent uh, findings on, on the races. Do you, do you agree with that? Is, uh, or is it consi your position consistent with uh, what is said by this group? No, sir. We take two positions with respect to that. One is that the evidence there is negative. They take the position that there is no reliable evidence that there is any harmful consequences of intermarriage. They do not say that the evidence shows conclusively that there are none. Their position in the UNESCO statement is that there is no evidence that there <coughs> is any harmful effect. That's the first position, that it is negative on this point. The second position is set out in Appendix C of our brief in which the next year, after the publication of the UNESCO statement, UNESCO also published another book entitled The Race Concepts, Results of an Inquiry, in which it set forth the criticisms that had been leveled at that statement by equally eminent anthropologists and biologists with respect to it. And we have on page 12 through 22 
of the appendix to our brief, published, extracted from the second UNESCO publication, a symposium of the critiques leveled at the UNESCO statement as well as other scientists who agreed with the UNESCO statement. So we say that the UNESCO statement is by no means definitive and it is not a statement which is at all joined in by the scientific community, especially on that point. That, I hardly think that the whole scientific community would agree with Mr. Gordon either, would they? I dare say they would not, Your Honor, but I do not find that on the psychosociological aspects there is any disagreement with this work. No one has challenged the statistics in this work, and it has been widely received, as we have put a, set forth in our brief, as putting statistical form on an embarrassing gap in the literature of the social sciences. And it has been, as I say, received by not only by scientists, but by uh, religious uh, individuals as well. It seems to me that <clears throat> the last paragraph of uh, UNESCO's uh, uh, report is rather uh, definite. It isn't uh, uh, general in any sense. It said the biological data given above stand in open contradiction to the tenets of racism. Racist theories can in no way pretend to have any scientific foundation, and the anthropologists should endeavor to prevent the results of their researches from being used in such a biased way that they would serve non-scientific ends. That's and, a rather definite finding, it yes, seems sir. to me. But there is equally, in the second publication of UNESCO, there is equally stringent criticism of that statement as being an attempt to close a system of knowledge and to state that there is no scientific evidence the other way when that is simply not the case. And the, the, this material, which we've set forth in our brief, is from the second UNESCO statement. In other words, UNESCO itself realized that its first publication elicited such criticism that it felt bound to put this criticism, as well as other supplementing the UNESCO statement, in a second publication, which shows that there is by no means unanimity of agreement on this point. And we have pointed out in further appendices to our brief, the 1964, the UNESCO statement, of course, was 1951-52. We have pointed out the recent uh, statements of Professor Engel, Professor of Physiology at uh, Chicago University, in which he cautions against interracial marriages on the ground not of any specific finding of his own, but on the grounds that there has not been sufficient scientific investigation of this matter for a physiologist, at least, to determine the true effects, physiologically speaking, of interracial marriage and cautions against it. And it is perfectly clear that the libraries are filled with uh, treatises and research studies of a cautionary nature which advise against it on a biological and genetic point of view. A number of these were cited in uh, Perez against Sharp in the dissenting opinion, and we have updated them by the citation of additional authorities, most of which were published in the last five years, which updates that study. Perhaps I can summarize this. I guess you would agree, wouldn't you, that we can't settle that controversy? I would, Your Honor. I have stated clearly in the brief that for the court to undertake to enter this controversy, the court would find itself mired in a Sabonian bog of conflicting scientific opinions, which I assure the court is sufficiently broad, sufficiently fluid, and sufficiently deep to swallow up the entire federal judiciary. If you read one volume on this point, you find 20 additional authorities cited in that one volume which you haven't read. By the time you read six articles on this point, you've got a bibliography of 150 books, all on the same subject, pro and con. May I ask you this question? Aside from all questions of genetics, psychology, psychiatry, sociology, and everything else, aside from all that, forgetting it for the moment, is there any doubt in your mind that the object of these statutes, the basic premise on which they rest, is that the white people are superior to the colored people and should not be permitted to marry? 
On the, the two statutes before Your Honor, I do think that that is not so. So far as 20-54 is concerned, the Act of Virginia of 1924 to preserve racial purity, I think that is unquestionably true. I'm not talking that, about what they labeled it. I'm just asking no, you I, for your I, judgment. I think it is was. Is there any possible basis? Uh, is, is, is not the basic premise on which they are written that the white people are secure to the colored people and that they should not, therefore, be permitted to marry because it might pollute the white race? Your Honor, I think that uh, there is. In other words, I think there is, is justification for saying that that is not but the... Do you, do you think there's a stronger justification that that is it? You mean, do you, I think historically yes, yes, that, 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 that the legislatures that which enacted them had that thought in mind? That's right. Yes, I think that, that's, that's clear. That's the basic thing on which they rested. That, that's on which the original enactments were rested. I think that's perfectly clear. But, Your Honor, I say that you are facing a problem in 1967. Well, I that don't to, know whether it's 1967 or 1868, no difference to me in discussion of equal protection of the laws. It is, as I would see it, is it not true that that's the basic reason it was done? I and think that a man who belongs to this race that is forbidden to marry Matter and the other race is bound to feel that he's not given the equal protection of the law. Well, the prohibition, Your Honor, works both ways. What's what? The prohibition works both ways. You say a man that is prohibited from marrying into another race feels inferior. The prohibition also prohibits a white that's person to marry a colored person. So prohibition is the same, but it's the common sense and pragmatics of it, not that it's a result of the old slavery days. The motivation. And the old feeling that the white man was superior to the colored man, which was exactly what the 14th Amendment was adopted to prevent. Your Honor, I think it is clear that the motivation of the earlier statutes, if you, by the motivation you undertake to analyze the feelings of the individual members of the legislature that were responsible for the adoption of the statutes, I think that is correct. But I do not see how that can affect the constitutional problem which is presented to this court where an enactment of the General Assembly of Virginia is on trial in which we submit was beyond the scope of the 14th Amendment as a first proposition and as a second proposition even if it wasn't beyond the scope of the 14th Amendment and is subjected to due process and equal protection tests, it is a justifiable regulation in view of today's evidence on the point. Well, I want to ask Mr. Michael Wayne if it does work uh, equally as against uh, both. Now, <clears throat> as counsel pointed out, uh, it, uh, it prevents, uh, it, it, it keeps the white race, as you, you would say, pure. But uh, does it keep the other races that way? You don't, uh, you don't have any prohibition against a Negro marrying a Malay? Or a, or a Mongolian? We don't have any prohibition against anyone in Virginia, so far as these statutes are concerned, marrying a Mongol or a Malay. Well, I know, but, but if it's to, pre, it's to preserve the purity of the races, why aren't they as much entitled to have the purity of their races protected as a, as a white race? They are, Your Honor, and if but they how are... Can you, how can you... Uh, what prohibits it under Virginia law? What prohibits... Uh, uh, a Negro from marrying a, an Indian? What pre prevents a Negro from marrying a Japanese or a Malay? There's nothing. nothing there's nothing that prohibits the whites either. Beg pardon? There's nothing that prohibits the whites either. As I've undertaken to say, Your Honor, that Virginia's statute deals with Virginia's situation. The Western statutes, <clears throat> where the ras racial classification <clears throat> of a state may be one third Caucasian, one third Negro, and one third Oriental, those statutes yeah. deal with that problem. Well, but the Virginia problem is not presented, <clears throat> the, uh, does not present any question of any social evil with which the legislature is required to deal resulting from interracial marriage between Negroes and Malays or whites and Malays because there is no significant population distribution well, I, to that I extent in Virginia. I understood from the brief of uh, Mr. Muratani that there are 1,750 uh, uh, Japanese in, in Virginia. According to the last census? 
I do not uh, say that this is not well, so. Well, do we, do we deny equal protection to them? No, sir. Because that, that, sort of a ra- to that sort of a racial composition, Your Honor, which constitutes less than one-fourth of one percent, does not present well, the probability of sufficient interracial marriages and sufficient difficulty for the legislature to be required to deal with it. The legislature in this statute has covered... You mean in principle because there are only a few people of one race in Virginia that Virginia can say they have no rights? It isn't a matter of saying that they have no rights, Your Honor. It's a matter of saying saying that they 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 do not present a problem. They don't have the same rights as the other, other, other race, the white race, to keep their race pure. We simply say that in Virginia, those, that segment of the population is does not, no, it does not present a problem which we are required to deal. The justification because for these statutes... Because you haven't statutes, got enough of them. Is that all? That is correct. Yes, sir. Well. And uh, on that point, we've said that it, it's, this court has clearly said that a statute is not unconstitutional simply because it does not reach every facet of the evil with which it might conceivably deal. Suppose in Virginia there were no Japanese. Would a statute be unconstitutional? Suppose that Virginia's population was entirely 100% white or color, in any proportion you want, but there was no Japanese in Virginia. Would a statute which did not undertake to regulate marriages between Mongols or Malays or Japanese be unconstitutional simply because it didn't regulate a relationship which doesn't even exist under Virginia law? Now, the fact that there are only a few does not, you cannot inflate this minority group into constitutional significance when you're talking about the legislature dealing with the problems with which it is likely to be faced. The statute doesn't have to apply with mathematical nicety. It is sufficient if it reasonably deals with what the legislature can reasonably apprehend to be an evil. And with 99% of the population in Virginia, in one of these two races, the danger of interracial marriages so far as Virginia is concerned is a danger of marriage between white and colored. Not the danger of marriage of either the white or the colored with races which, for all intents and purposes, hardly exist. As one of the text writers which they have cited in their brief, Mr. Applebaum, in a uh, treatise entitled Miscegenation Statutes, a Constitutional and Social Problem, which is probably the most balanced analysis of these statutes that we have found, says this. Coverage of other races in the South is hardly necessary since they scarcely exist. And surely this is true under uh, equal protection clause. The legislature of Virginia is not required to foresee that someday there may be in Virginia a significant population of another racial group which may require Virginia to deal with that problem. There are a lot of Indians in the South, aren't there? In the South generally, yes. More in the Midwest, I think. This man says there weren't. Very, Very few in Virginia. As I say, the statistics show that all other races combined outside of white and Negro constitute less than 25, one hundredths of one percent of Virginia's population, according to the 1960 census. And those figures have not varied more than one or two percent from the 1950 population figures. So that the problem of other types of interracial marriages which cause the interracial marriage statutes of Western states to consider the Oriental problem just simply doesn't exist in Virginia. Now, but I suppose that if either of us happened to be one of the 1,750 Japanese who were in the, in the state, and you had a law of that kind, we'd, uh, we'd feel that we were somewhat demeaned, would we not? I don't see how we would, Your Honor. I mean, the, the, so far as this statute is concerned, there's no prohibition against whites or Negroes marrying any other races. No, oh, there is. It would be probably against Japanese marrying whites. No, sir, not under this statute. There is just I no prohibition. I would think it was a rather open question as to whether... Well, they do, Your Honor, because they insist on dragging into this case statutes which are not here, which they can easily attack. I mean, it's a, a well-known stratagem to attack the easy statute, which is simply not involved in this case. Does your statute require, uh, apply only to colored people, Negroes? White and colored. White and colored. That's what all. What are colored? Colored people are defined in Virginia statute the same way they're defined by the United States Department of Census, Your Honor. Right. Those right. people who have Negro blood or have uh, any mixed Negro blood are considered to be colored people. The Virginia well, statute says it. Does, it does apply, doesn't it, to American Indians? 
if, they, if anyone has more than one sixteenth of Indian blood in them, it applies to him, doesn't it? No, so that's 2054 again. That's the statute. Know, that's, with, that's your same, same body of law in this area, isn't it? No, sir, because the two statutes which you have involved in this case, Your Honor, were originally started as a prototype in 1691, and they have been on the Virginia books for more than two centuries. The law to which they refer, the law growing out of what they call the hysteria of the 1920s, is an entirely separate law which was designed to preserve the purity of the white race. It is a statute which is not before this court, and a statute which we are not defending. The, start, the statute and Have the only statute... Have you declared it to be unconstitutional or... No, sir. ...or invalid? No, sir. The Virginia courts have not. It's one of a group of statutes, is it not? It's intended to make it intolerable <coughs> or impossible or to be very burdensome for white and colored people to marry and for Japanese and white people to marry and all these others. How, how can they be separated? I don't quite understand. They can be separated, Your Honor, because of the fact that historically and in their coverage and in the context of this case, they are different. The act for Are they the, not all based on the premise of doing something to make it bad or hard or difficult or illegal for the two groups to marry? The statute before your honors is of I that nature. All the, the, groups. the two groups. But the statute that to which they refer, which is not mentioned in the Virginia opinion, which has never been applied to them, which is not now applied to them, and which this court, we respectfully submit, cannot possibly reach, is a statute which forbids a white person to marry any other than a white person. What, what effect does that have on a white person and a colored person it who, married in, who married in New York and moved to Virginia to live? A white person and a colored person who married in New York and moved to Virginia to live under that statute would not be a, their marriage would not be recognized in Virginia under that statute or under this statute. Under Virginia law. Under Virginia law. That's so that they would be living in adultery. That's correct, Your Honor. Well, uh, either that or, uh, or fornication. fornication or illicit cohabit or that illicit could cohabit. Be punished, yes, sir. As a felon. It, it, uh, As a that, felon. No, sir. Uh, the marriage, you see, if it were between residents of New York, would not offend either of these two statutes at all. It would be a felony if they were Virginia residents and left the state for that purpose. I thought you had a general statute that says every, <clears throat> every marriage between a colored person and a white was void. That's right. Without the necessity of a divorce, divorce or, or any other. other judicial decree. That's correct, Your Honor. Then, then but, they would be... Uh, they, they would be living in adultery, would they not? No, sir, because Virginia would not recognize the marriage as void, and the offense there would probably be the same type of offense that this court considered in McLaughlin against Florida, namely illicit cohabitation. I and thought Mr. you said Mino. earlier in your argument that if the, uh, <clears throat> if the state of Virginia had, had shown as uh, strong an interest uh, as they showed in this case to to preserve the purity of the races, that they probably would not recognize the marriage of, uh, of another state. I think that is true, Your Honor, but it does not follow that if they came to Virginia, they would be guilty of a felony. Only those citizens of Virginia who purport to engage in a miscegenetic marriage or who leave the state and go to another state with the intention of returning to Virginia to evade the law are guilty of a felony. The legal consequences would flow, which would flow from the position you put would be that Virginia would not recognize this couple as being married at all. They would not therefore violate... They fall, therefore, they'd fall the, under the law, would they not? Therefore, they would fall under the misdemeanor statutes, I believe it is, Your Honor, forbidding illicit cohabitation, not it'd under be, this... It would be criminal. It would be criminal, yes. yes but sure. I, I thought you had a statute which said that, <coughs> that uh, cohabitation between whites or between Negroes was only a misdemeanor, but that if it was between white and Negro, it was a felony. No, sir, that's the Florida case. Beg pardon? That is, that is the Florida case, which the yeah. court considered. In Virginia, the law is just a simple, non-racial, well, illicit cohabitation statute. Mm -hmm. In the 
brief on behalf of Appalachians, and with this I will move to a conclusion. An article is cited which, as I say, we think it to be the best balanced of the authorities investigating this problem. I suppose that in reading from it, I can summarize best the results of an investigation of the materials which are available and a characterization of those materials. The author of that article says this, reference to scientific and sociological evidence of the undesirability of amalgamation is frequently made, but the courts have rarely examined any of this evidence. The California court in Perez made the first real inquiry into the evidence and found that the weight of the evidence refuted the view that the Negro race or the progeny of interracial marriage is inferior. It is not the purpose of this article to reach any conclusion regarding the available scientific data on the results of miscegenation. It will suffice to indicate by a brief survey of the materials that there may arguably be sufficient evidence on both sides of the controversy to afford some basis for a legislature to take either side. He goes on, a large number of studies and research projects have concluded that miscegenation is undesirable. He points out that Justice Schenck, dissenting in Perez, cited ten authorities, one of which itself cited ten additional authorities, which would support a legislative finding that amalgamation of the races is inimical to the public welfare. He says that these studies were frequently made by notable scientists and have reached that conclusion. He then goes on and says the authorities finding that interracial intermixture has no harmful effects are also quite numerous, and he considers the authorities available on that point, including the UNESCO statement. And he concludes, nonetheless, there is still considerable debate in comparatively recent studies as to the desirability of racial intermixture. Thus, even today, a legislature can find some scientific support for the position that miscegenation should be banned. He then goes on to say that, of course, the sociological evidence is even more persuasive in support of a policy against miscegenation. And in a later portion of the article, he takes the position that even if the presumption of the validity of the statute should be reversed and the state were required to carry the burden of justifying the statute as a piece of social legislation, he says that the social harm argument would present a closer case. He said, but again, it is not likely that the state could prove that the social difficulties of the children of miscegenous couples are exceptional enough to overcome a presumption against racial categorization. He's assuming here that the presumption is against the state. Concrete evidence of the effect upon such children would be difficult to obtain, particularly since miscegenation is not widespread. The state, then, could not present any definite estimate of the potential of the evil it is attempting to prevent. A state might produce a strong case by investing in research, but that would involve considerable time and expense. Now, of course, we say it involves no time, and the expense is simply an expenditure of $10. The study which he is suggesting could be made to, for, to enable the state to carry the burden of justifying the statute, even if the burden were upon the state, has already been made, and it was rolling off the presses even as Mr. Applebaum wrote this article. There is no assuming, reference in that. Assuming, Mr. Uh, Mr. McElwain, that, uh, that is correct in his scientific findings, does he equate any of those things to, to the rights of people under the 14th Amendment, the equal protection of the laws? Yes, indeed, Your Honor. He, 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 he does that. He, on does both he? sides of the question. Yes, Your Honor. He argues that he, ar he argues both sides of the question. Is he a, is he a legal writer? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the gentleman in question is a member of the bar of the District of Columbia, uh, an associate of Covington, Burling, and Washington, a BA of Yale University, and an LLB at the Harvard Law School. He concludes, or I would assume he concludes, that uh, it is necessary for the court to reverse the presumption in favor of the legislation to be a presumption against the legislation for these statutes to be declared unconstitutional. If the presumption in favor of the legislation is permitted to prevail, then there is arguable evidence on both sides of this question, and the court is not justified in overturning the legislative determination on this point. If the presumption is against us, we say that 
despite the fact that this article would seem to indicate that the state couldn't carry the burden, he said the particular difficulty would be in the absence of evidence of a sociological nature, which we say is now at hand, and which clearly shows that the state has a justifiable and overriding interest in preventing interracial marriages. Of course, we go fundamentally to the proposition that for over a hundred years since the 14th Amendment was adopted, numerous states, as late as 1956, a majority of the states, and now even 16 states, have been exercising this power without any question being raised as to the authority of the states to exercise this power. Those happen to be the same 16 states that had the school segregation uh, laws, uh, do they not? Yes, a number of them are not, Your Honor. Most, most of them, most of them are. Ones? Most of them are southern or border states. The 16 are not among those that had segregation laws. Hmm. Your Honor has now asked me a question. I am not sure about the states that had the miscegenation laws. I can give Your Honor the states which now. Uh, the 16 states which yeah. have these laws on their on their books at the present yeah. time, but uh, I do not have available the the states which had uh, anti-miscegenation. I mean, the school segregation statutes. No, I'm talking about those 16 that I I've, I've been I've just been looking at the list and I I can't uh, I can't see. Uh, a single one of these states that uh, that wasn't among those that had miscegenate or had uh, the school segregation laws. Uh, you may may find one, but uh, I think they're identical. Uh, well, Missouri, I'm not sure. Yes, Missouri, Missouri did. Missouri did, did have. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it Oklahoma made... Oklahoma is a border state. Oklahoma is a border had, state, and it, it, had, it had, I believe, yes. it Well, but, it, uh, it isn't a matter of any great uh, consequence. No, so of I course, we say that there were 30 states, states in 1950 anyway. which had these statutes, and those states included a number of the western states, uh, yes. Wyoming, California, and Washington. But in they 19, all, in 1950, they've all... They've, all, out they've out repealed their statutes, as, as Maryland has repealed it. And we say that this would indicate to us that... This problem is one which should be left to the legislature. Some states, each individual state, has the right to make this determination for itself. Because under the 14th Amendment, it was intended to leave the problem there. The judicial decisions contemporaneous with the 14th Amendment, and the, all of the decisions with the exception of the Perez case since that time, has confirmed the common understanding of everyone that these statutes were not within the scope of the 14th Amendment. And we say it is unlikely that judges from all the states and from both judiciaries could have, for so long a period of time, acted in disregard of the provisions of the Constitution or in any ignorance of what its provisions were intended to accomplish. Could I ask you a question before you sit down? Assuming for the moment that your historical argument is rejected, how would you rationalize a decision of holding this statute with Boris Brown against the Board of Education? You mean rationalize a decision upholding this statute? Upholding this statute. Assuming now that the, your historical argument is rejected, yes, and I'm expressing no view on that or intimating no view of whatever, uh, but starting from that premise, how would you rationalize a decision upholding this statute with Brown against the board? Well, I would say that Brown against the Board of Education proceeded upon the premise that education was fundamental to good citizenship that it was a necessary requirement of good citizenship, that all children were, in the <coughs> modern age, required to be educated, and that the right to be educated in the present-day world was one of overriding importance, and that 
that right could not be infringed by a statute which the court found uh, made the educational opportunities inherently unequal. Now, wouldn't you say the right to marry and to bear children is equally important? I would say that the right to marry, if I were rationalizing a decision upholding it, would, under the decisions of this court, in Meyer against Nebraska, and Pierce against Society of Sisters and Skinner versus Oklahoma, but also say that the right to marry is a right, but it is, there is no requirement that people marry, and therefore a statute which forbids marriage is not the same as forbidding children to receive education. Now, if, you're going to, if you say a decision is going to uphold the statute, then you just naturally flow from the fact that marriage is a right, that uh, it cannot be arbitrarily infringed, then if you make the statement that uh, any racial classification necessarily infringes the right, then you have a decision, of course, which would be consistent with Brown against the Board of Education, if you take that view. But in that case, you do not come to the proposition of the power of the state to forbid interracial marriages and the interest of the state in doing so on the basis of the valid scientific evidence that exists on the detrimental effects of interracial marriage. I don't see how you can start with a right and come to the proposition that the state statute infringes the right unless you exclude the evidence which tends to show that the statute in question is rational because even rights, the right to marry is subjective to reasonable limitations by the state, has always been. Polygamy statutes have never been questioned. <coughs> Incest statutes have never been questioned. They have, in fact, been specifically upheld. And upheld against a charge in Reynolds against the United States that the, the person convicted there had a religious duty to marry. Not that he had a right to marry. His religious tenets as a Mormon required him to marry. And this court held that uh, the fact that his religious tenet required him to do so, did not prevent him from being convicted criminally for engaging in a polygamous marriage. So you can't reach the conclusion that this statute infringes a right under the 14th Amendment without examining the evidence on behalf of the state to show that the infringement is a reasonable one. Just as reasonable, as far as we can uh, determine, there's far more evidence of the reasonableness of a ban against interracial marriage than there is against polygamous or incestuous marriages so far as the scientific proposition is concerned. But I cannot conceive of this court striking down a polygamy or incest statute on the basis of scientific evidence. And I submit that it would be no more appropriate for this court to invalidate the misogenetic statute on that basis. Mr. McQueen, didn't, didn't we in the... Uh Segregation cases have also argued to us what was supposed to be scientific evidence to the, to the effect that the whites would be injured by having to go to school with the, uh, with the Negroes. Your Honor, I... Isn't that, isn't that the same argument you're making here? Yes, sir, it is. But it is being made in a context in which the evidence in support of the proposition is existing evidence which is voluminous in its character and which supports the view not of racial superiority or inferiority, but a simple matter of difference, that the difference is such that the progeny of the intermarried are harmed by it and that the divorce rate arises from the difference, not from the inferiority or, su or superiority of either race. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Corn. May it please the court. The state has made a strong argument in favor of the court limiting its decision to sections 2058 and 2059, but has very, very carefully avoided the fact that 2058, which which is classified as an evasion statute, is much more than that. 2058 cannot exist without 2054 because it refers to a white person. 
and there is nowhere else in the Virginia Code that a white person is defined other than in Section 2054, which is the general ban on interracial marriages. So if he says that 2058 and 59 are before this court, it is absolutely, nece absolutely necessary that 2054 also be considered because 58 and 59 could not stand without the definition in 54. In addition, the definition of colored person appears in Section 1-14 of the Virginia Code and similarly is here involved. These are the very minimum number of sections which could possibly be involved. But we go further. When the Racial Integrity Act of 1924 was passed, it was passed as a single act with 10 sections. It is true, and we do not argue with the state, that 2058 and 59 were sections which had pre-existed the Racial Integrity Act of 1924 and were just added on with the other sections. But it was part and parcel, one act. And today, the mere fact that it's codified in the Virginia Code with different numbers does not detract from the fact that it was passed as one legislative act on one day with the same vote before the Virginia legislature. They are inseparable. The state has urged that the legislative history is conclusive on the 14th Amendment and that nobody has stated that the 14th Amendment did expand the meaning of equal protection and due process over and above what was meant to be included in the Civil Rights Act of 1866. In our brief at page 30, we take issue with this, and again at page 32, citing Bickle, the original understanding of the segregation decision. And we go on to say, referring to the Bickle work, that a correct appraisal of the legislative history of the broad guarantees of the 14th Amendment for purposes of constitutional adjudication is that they were open-ended and meant to be expounded in light of changing times and circumstances. On page 32, we indicate that the Bickel article has concluded that the principle of the Brown case should control the constitutionality of the miscegenation laws. This is in the Bickel article, The Least Dangerous Branch, at page 71, published in 1962. This is a definitive work, and this is a study of the legislative history of the 14th Amendment that has reached the very conclusion that the state would have us believe nobody can reach. Oh, yes, Your Honor. Another point of statutory construction, though, Your Honor, which I think is very significant. If the framers had the intent to exclude anti-miscegenation statutes, it would have been taken but a single phrase in the 14th Amendment to say excluding anti-miscegenation statutes. The language was broad, the language was sweeping, the language meant to include equal protection for Negroes. That was at the very heart of it. And that equal protection included the right to marry as any other human being had the right to marry, subject to only the same limitations. The state has said that the amount of persons other than Negroes and whites involved is very insignificant and very small. Well, this is the first Negro-white miscegenation case in Virginia to come to the Supreme Court. It is the first Negro-white miscegenation case to go to the Supreme Court of Appeals of Virginia. There have been a handful of others, every single one of them, involving a person of what might be called yellow extraction or Malaysian or Filipino and white persons. So to say that the problem itself is insignificant in Virginia is not at all true is reflected in the actual case law in Virginia. The case of Kalma versus Kalma involved a Filipino. The case of Name versus Name involved a possible Oriental whose background was not exactly clear from the record. Now, the state is ignoring a very important point, which we cannot overemphasize if this decision only goes to sections 58 and 59 of the statute. And that is the right of Richard and Mildred Loving to wake up in the morning or to go to sleep at night knowing that the sheriff will not be knocking on their door or shining a light 
in their face in the privacy of their bedroom for illicit cohabitation. If 58 and 59 are found unconstitutional and 54 is allowed to remain on the books, that is precisely what can happen. It will be an exact repetition of what in fact did happen to them. And this court will not have given the Lovings the relief they require. The Lovings have the right to go to sleep at night knowing that should, not, should they not awake in the morning, their children would have the right to inherit from them under intestacy. They have the right to be secure in knowing that if they go to sleep and do not wake in the morning, that one of them, a survivor of them, has the right to Social Security benefits. All of these are denied to them, and they will not be denied to them if the whole anti-miscegenation scheme of Virginia, sections 20 through 50 through, through 20-60, are found unconstitutional. While I do not place great emphasis on the work of Rabbi Gordon, I feel compelled to note that in the state's quotes from Rabbi Gordon, there is conspicuous absence of the following quotation uh, on appendix page four, which uh, would fit neatly in the ellipses shown there. Rabbi Gordon states, and it is not printed in the state's brief, our democracy would soon be defeated if any group on the American scene was required to cut itself off from contacts with persons of other religions or races. The segregation of any group, religious or racial, either voluntarily or involuntarily, is unthinkable and even dangerous to the body politic. Now, Virginia stands here today, and in this loving case, for the first time, tries to find a justification other than white racial supremacy for the existence of its statute. Mr. McElwain is quite candid that this is a current day justification, not the justification of the framers. On the one hand, I see a little dilemma here. He asks that the court look to the intent of the framers of the 14th Amendment, but to ignore the framers of the 1924 Act to preserve racial integrity in Virginia. It is not a dilemma I would like to be in. Well, I have no quarrel with that statement. You're almost in the same dilemma yourself, aren't you? Because according to the Virginia <coughs> legislative history of the Virginia statute, uh, but uh, claiming that the legislative history of the 14th Amendment oh, is important. No, I, I don't feel that dilemma at all, Your Honor. We do not for a moment concede that the legislative history of the 14th Amendment is clear or conclusive that they meant to exclude miscegenetic marriages, while Mr. McElwain has stood here and I believe conceded that the intent of the framers of the 1924 Act of, of Racial Integrity was a white supremacy act. So I don't, uh, I, I don't feel at all uncomfortable in that situation. Now, on the one hand, the state urges that it is not necessary to prohibit or to, for the statute to go against smaller minority groups that exist in Virginia. And I say, then why have they taken the trouble in Section 54 to prohibit marriages between whites and Malaysians or whites and anybody else? The fact of the matter is that it is important in the statutory scheme of Virginia to discriminate against anybody but white people. Now, while there is no definitive case decision as to whether or not a New York couple involved in a miscegenetic marriage moving to Virginia would be prosecuted for a felony, and I admit it might be open to some judicial interpretation, I feel strongly, and I think the court can reach this decision, and, and I think some authorities uh, writing in law journals have reached the decision that I, under Section 2059, referring to any white person intermarrying with a colored person, he shall be guilty of a felony and shall be punished by confinement in the penitentiary for not 
less than one or more than five years, I don't see how there's any doubt appearing in the very same Racial Integrity Act of 1924, five sections after the act which says it shall hereafter be unlawful for any white person in this state to marry any save a white person, I don't see how it is possible to conclude that even a New York couple would not be prosecuted for a felony in Virginia. In any event, the state has conceded that they certainly would be guilty of a crime, that of illicit cohabitation, and has left the rest open. We argue that certainly that there is no doubt that there are some prosecutors at the lower trial level, some places in Virginia, that would have no compunction whatsoever in going ahead and prosecuting under 59 as a felony couples moving into the state involved in a miscegenetic marriage. Not to our knowledge and to our research, Your Honor. I believe some of the uh, some of the northern states did, Your Honor. I think the uh, state's position and the epilogue's position come together and agree on only one point: that the court should not go into the morass of sociological evidence that is available on both sides of the question. We strongly urge that it is not necessary and that our position on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, specifically related to it being an anti-racial amendment, give this court sufficient breadth and sufficient depth to invalidate the entire statutory scheme. <laughs>